that before we did jump right in. Uh, so as I said, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I am Mary Margaret Deneen. I am the director of the Global Programs Division and the Just Track Program Director with the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative. And I'm pleased to welcome everyone to day one of the Measurement Talks 2 event. This is just one of several of the Just Track activities uh, that we undertake to support collaboration, shared learning, and evidence-based programming in the justice sector. I would like to thank you, uh, the participants, the presenters, uh, moderators, and my colleagues, um, including those who are behind the scenes today, uh, Jay, Abby, Andrea, and Jeremy, who are all helping us uh, execute this activity this morning as well as um, our partners at the Department of State uh, Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs, who fund the Just Trap program. Uh, some of you may have joined us for uh, the Justice Sector Measurement Talks 1, which took place uh, last September. Um, and if you did, we're happy to welcome you back. And just as last year, this year, we're pleased to have distinguished presenters who like you are working to address timely and critical issues in the area of justice sector measurement. Uh, before we begin, I have just a few housekeeping announcements. Um, as I mentioned, um, the event will be recorded and it will be posted on the Just Track Plus Knowledge Portal. So if you have colleagues who weren't able to join, uh, please have them check the portal uh, in a week or so and they'll be able to uh, see the presentation there. Uh, we place the agenda uh, for today's event uh, in the chat box, uh, and also the biographies. Uh, so if you are interested in having in knowing more background about our, our presenters today, uh, we encourage you to take a look at the biographies. Um, again, as you're joining us, if you haven't, we welcome you to introduce yourself in the chat box uh, so that we, we know who's part of the talks this morning. Um, and questions and comments are most welcome. Uh, we would really like a lot of talking during uh, the justice sector measurement talks uh, between and among you and the presenters this morning. Please put your questions and your comments in the chat box um, and you can do that throughout the presentations. We will be using Mentimeter uh, for the first presentation and also at the end of the discussions today for a participant survey. Uh, you can access Mentimeter on your phone or any other device and the uh, website for Mentimeter and the code for this morning are both on the slide and they're in the chat box. Um, and we invite you to join us there and particularly encourage you uh, to stay online at the end of the discussion this morning and participate in the participant survey. Um, it is one of our measurement tools and it's really important for us to have your input. So thank you for that. And if you're not already a member of the Just Track Knowledge Portal, uh, we ask you to sign up and join the Knowledge Portal. Uh, there are uh, myriad resources there uh, relevant to the work that you're doing, as well as the opportunity to participate in the discussion boards, uh, which we encourage as a continuation of the Justice Sector Measurement Talks. Um, I am happy to say that we have two moderators this morning. Uh, Beth Wiggins, who is the Director of the Research Division at the Federal Judicial Center, and also my colleague Silvana Stanga, uh, who is the Senior Technical Advisor focused on judicial strengthening and training at ABA Rowley. And they will be moderating our discussions on today's theme, which is Approaches to Assessing and Measuring Inclusive Rights-Focused Judicial Programming. Uh, and we're honored uh, to have representatives from the Federal Judicial Center, the FJC, with us. The FJC is the research institution for the federal judiciary. It was established by the U.S. Congress in 1967 on the recommendation of Chief Justice Earl Warren and the Judicial Conference of the U.S. The FJC has vast experience in measuring results uh, in the ju in justice, justice sector work. And I'm pleased to turn it over to Beth Wiggins, the director of the research division at FJC and her team for our first presentation. Thank you, Mary Margaret. Um, I am going to quickly turn it over to the researchers who are here to talk with you today. I don't want to take more of your time. Um, I do want to let you know that um, Carly and Jana are two of about 25 researchers at the FJC. Um, we conduct research on different facets of the federal courts. 
and um, we have an international office which also does some evaluation work around around the world. Um, Carly's background um, is she has a law degree as well as a um, doctorate in cognitive psychology. Um, and Jana is a data scientist, I would say data scientist extraordinaire um, with um, a background in program evaluation. And I'm pleased that they're for this opportunity for them to tell you about one of the projects they've been doing in the past couple of years. Um, so Jana, Carly, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, uh, depending on where you are in the world. And uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so as Beth said, uh, I am Carly Giffen and I work as a research associate at the Federal Judicial Center. Um, and I'm joined this morning uh, by two of the team members who helped with the evaluation that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, and what we're going to be talking to you about today is an assessment we all worked on together with the High School of Justice in Georgia. And the high school is their judicial education agency. Uh, but before we sort of jump right into the specifics of that topic, we have our, our first uh, quick poll for you. Uh, next slide. So this is one of the Mentimeter polls that um, Mary Margaret talked about at the beginning. Uh, if the Mentimeter link is in the chat, um, so you'll need to use that to vote. But this first question, we just wanted to see how would you all describe your level of familiarity with program evaluation? Because that will help us to see where it would be most useful for us to focus as we go through. Uh, so option A is that you routinely apply these principles and concepts in your work. Uh, option B is that you sometimes apply the principles and concepts of program evaluation in a professional setting. C is that you're familiar with these principles and concepts, uh, but haven't applied them professionally. Uh, and then D would be that you are unfamiliar with these principles and concepts, but you must be at least interested or you probably wouldn't be here today. Um, so I'll give you a minute or so to choose which of these categories you fall into uh, in the Mentimeter. Okay. All right. So we've got, that's great actually that we've got a little bit of a spread. Most of you have at least a little bit of familiarity, but it's a it's a good spread, which I think will will fit this talk. Well, we've tried to to keep it at a level that will be interesting for those of you who are more familiar, um, but shouldn't be too jargony uh, for those of you who might be a little bit less familiar as well. Um, this is helpful for us as we gauge how to how to move forward. Um, OK, all right, I think we can move to the, the next slide. Okay, so today we're going to be going through and talking about the entire process that we and our partners went through and getting this program assessment up and running. Um, and I'm going to start out by talking about how we set the scope of the evaluation and how we selected which program to assess. Because a little bit unusually in, for most projects is in this project, we didn't have a clear program assessment, like a clear program to assess chosen at the beginning. So we'll talk about that process and I will talk about the information gathering we did. Uh, and then Jana, Jana is gonna talk about developing the assessment tool and what it ended up looking like. Uh, and then our uh, partner Nino is who works with East West Management and was sort of our key Georgian partner on the ground. Uh, we'll talk about the actual implementation of the assessment and some of those results. Um, because she has an insight into that that uh, Jan and I do not. Uh, and so then we'll end with a question and answer period. Um, and so if you have any questions as you go along, please feel free to drop them in the chat. We'll, we'll try to monitor that and refer back to that at the Q&A, or you can do that at the end as well. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, so first, I'm just going to start by explaining how we chose which program to evaluate because that was a little bit of a unique process uh, in this project, and then how we sort of set the scope of the evaluation. Next slide, please. So in the spring summer of 2021, the Federal Judicial Center uh, was invited to work with Georgia's High School of Justice and other partners to assess one of their judicial education programs. Um, and one of the emphasis, the, one of the key emphasis on, in this project was that it was important to the high school that whatever program we chose to assess, that the tool we created would be useful, not just to the individual program selected, but that it could also serve as a model for the evaluation of other programs moving forward. So we wanted to work together to create a sound assessment of the chosen program, but also provide something that the high school could adapt so that program assessment could be more easily used in more of their programs. And so after some initial discussions, um, our Georgian partners identified two possible programs that we could assess. Uh, and one of them was on a relatively new law uh, concerning the rights of children in the legal system. And the other was a more established program on uh, legal ethics. And both of these programs were given to judges. So the audience was relatively similar, um, but both of them presented challenges uh, for an evaluation. Next slide, please. So the first program uh, that was put up as a candidate for this assessment, uh, it was designed to inform judges about this pretty new law concerning the rights of children in the Georgian legal system. Uh, and this program was unique in a few ways. Uh, so first was just the relative novelty of the law that it focused on. So at the time we began work on the project, it had been in place only a few years. Uh, and much of that time had been during the COVID-19 pandemic. So even experienced judges might be unfamiliar with the law itself or might not have had a chance to apply it in any of their proceedings. The second sort of unique aspect of this program was that the program itself was spaced over three days and it was taught by a different person each day. Um, so the first day focused on the legal standards uh, and was taught by judges. Uh, the second day focused on the role of the psychologist, uh, and that was taught by a psychologist. And the third day focused on the role of the sociologist and was taught by a, or sorry, a social worker, uh, and was taught by a social worker. And the last unique aspect of this first program was that the high school was interested in designing a follow-up course. So, uh, they were really interested in having feedback on how this first course had done and any gaps that there might be so that they could design this later course. Um, the other program we discussed for the assessment was on the fundamentals of judicial ethics. And in some ways, this program was an easier target for assessment because the codes and principles of legal ethics were well established and would have been fairly well known by most, if not all, legal practitioners. Um, and it was also administered by the same trainers each day. So there was a greater consistency across the whole program. But in other ways, this was also a challenging program to assess. Um, topics like legal ethics are often a little bit more abstract. So there are some hard and fast rules, but there are also uh, less well-defined aspects that serve as guides for appropriate behavior but can't really account for every individual circumstance. Um, and that's true in many countries, including the US. Um, and those of you who are familiar with assessments know that it's sometimes much harder to assess programs that have sort of less well-defined aspects to them. Um, and there were also certain challenges that would have been true regardless of which of these programs we chose for the assessment. Um, sort of chief among them, uh, for Jana and myself was that we didn't speak the language. So all the material had to be translated. Uh, we weren't familiar with their legal system. So we had to do a little bit of research uh, on the legal system to see how these programs operated, how the laws that they were talking about worked in that system. And then as to the assessment itself, 
uh, getting the tool ready for use, we only had a, a relatively short period of a few months to get this tool ready. Um, and then due to the timing being during the pandemic, we had to have all of our meetings online and it was possible that the assessment that we produced would have to be done at least the first couple of times also online. So we needed to get a tool together that would work both online and then eventually in person as well. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and so here we have a, another Mentimeter question for all of you. So considering what you know about program assessment, many of you said you were, were familiar, uh, and what I've told you about sort of the goals of this assessment overall, as well as the description of these two programs, which of these would you have chosen for the assessment? Uh, A, the program on the rights of the child, or B, the program on legal ethics? I'll give you a minute here to vote. So this is actually kind of interesting, you know, for me as a researcher that the split is is pretty close because there really were sort of benefits and challenges for both of these programs, both from an assessment standpoint um, and from the utility standpoint uh, for the high school uh, itself. But your voting sort of uh, follows what you probably all knew already happened here as well. Um, yeah, we, I think we can go to the to the next slide. Um, so some of you may have been swayed in your selection because you realize that ultimately we did choose the program on the rights of the child and you didn't want to make me feel bad during my presentation. Um, but we chose the program on the rights of the child for three reasons that we thought were really important. Uh, the first of which was this was the program that the high school was most interested in assessing in part because it was so new and in part because they were considering a follow-up. So having a good, strong assessment of this program was gonna be really useful individually. Um, but we also knew that we could deliver a really good assessment tool in the kind of short time that we'd been allotted. Um, and finally, which was important to this project, we knew that the assessment tool we created for this program could easily be adapted and would serve as a really good model for other programs, making it easier for those them to assess those in the future. So for all three of these reasons, we thought that was really weighed in favor of this selection. And so after we, okay, I see a, a raised hand. And if you wanna unmute yourself and ask a question, I'm happy to, to do that to answer that now. Yeah, sorry. Um, hi, my name is Leslie. Um, I just had a question for for the three reasons you listed. Um, do you think that if you would have assessed the other program, if you would have developed an uh, assessment tool for the other program, do you not think it could have been adapted to other programs? Um, because I think, according at least to my understanding of things, um, because it's, it has been more longstanding, you probably have more information, you probably have more background, um, and you probably have more data. So that would probably allow you to expand upon your findings to other programs. So can you kind of explain your reason why you think, or maybe you don't think, but essentially like what won you over? Is it because the HSOJ wanted to assess that program the most, or was it just that you didn't, um, yeah, no, that's okay. that's actually, that's a really good point. It's, I sh it is not that any assessment that we made for the judicial ethics programs couldn't also have been adapted. It was sort of the combination of all three of these that weighed in favor of this program, right? It was that we knew we could deliver a very good assessment tool that could be adapted, and the High School of Justice had other reasons that they were really interested in having right now a really good assessment of this program. But you're completely correct that an assessment that we made for the other program also could have been adapted. So it was kind of the, the combination of all of these things. And I think that happens in assessments, right? That there are a combination of factors that sometimes weigh towards one course or the other. But yeah, you're absolutely correct. Yep. Um, okay, Abby, if you could go to the next slide. So after we settled on the program, we had to gather all of the information 
we needed to perform the assessment. Next slide. So as those of you who have worked on program assessments know, there is sort of this feedback loop when you do this. Uh, you request information that you think you need, you review it, develop more questions, and then the loop sort of starts again. Um, in this case, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the task was somewhat complicated by the fact that all of the relevant materials needed to be translated. So for this reason, we did try to be really targeted in our requests to make sure that we weren't asking for translations of more material than we would actually need. Um, because one important thing when we're doing evaluations or projects um, at the FGC, and I'm sure is true in all of your work as well, we try to be really respectful of the time of people that we are working with, um, both in the programs we are assessing and as participants in, in programs that we put on ourselves. Uh, so we did try to be really targeted in our, our request for information, um, though it still required multiple rounds of us asking for information and then additional information. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, another poll, and this one is maybe a little bit more complicated because there are more factors to weigh. Um, but essentially, the, the question we're asking is, based on your knowledge of assessments generally uh, and what we've told you about this specific program, which of the following information do you think would have been most helpful or would you have wanted sort of first right off the bat? All of this is certainly important and helpful, um, but which of these things might you have prioritized first? Uh, the slides used by the presenters during their presentations uh, on, the different, on the three different days of the training, handouts that were given to judges during the program, uh, the assessment sheet that the high school had been giving out at the end of the three-day program, uh, information on the background and experience of the trainers, um, or something else. Uh, and if you choose something else, uh, type it in the chat and I will uh, try to pay attention and, and grab a few of those as well. Um, so I'll give you uh, a minute to, to vote on this and get your thoughts. Okay, yeah, so, so this is kind of interesting. I mean, and in a sense, you're all absolutely right because all of this um, is important. And even as we were prioritizing information, we did end up asking for a lot of different information, some of which fell into all of these categories um, and which our, our Georgian partners graciously uh, translated for us. Um, but it looks like so the assessment sheet is sort of what many of you would have wanted first and the slides. Um, those seem to be the, the two winners, although there are certainly votes for everyone, for all of these. And then in the chat for other, I have program concept notes, which I think you, by which I think you mean sort of the, the goals of the program itself, what the trainers were, were going for. Um, Okay, yeah, so I, I agree with, with all of you and sort of how this shook out, I think will be interesting when you see our, our next slide as well. So yes, Abby, if you could switch to the next slide, thank you. Okay, so we requested a lot of information, um, but some of the things that we sort of prioritized at the beginning to get us started, um, were program goals, which I think is related to, to the suggestion in the chat. Um, we wanted to know really what were the trainers trying to get across to the judges? What should the judges know when they walked out? Um, and we wanted this information for the program overall and then each of the different sections. Uh, because obviously you can't assess how well the program is doing unless you know what it's trying to do. And we could have tried to infer that from some of the material, but we really wanted to hear that as directly from the trainers as we possibly could. We also wanted to look at the program. Sorry, Abby, if you could please go back. Thank you. Uh, we also wanted to look at the program structure. So we wanted to know if the program changed at all. Was it taught slightly differently in different municipalities because of local laws? 
had it changed over time such that people who took it at the beginning and people who took it at the end would have gotten slightly different information because we wanted to know if we need to tailor the assessment um, in different ways for different groups of people. We were also interested in the audience. Did all judges take this or was it just one type of judge, just criminal judges, just new judges? Um, because that would change how we thought they might apply it and the context in which they might be using it. Uh, we also did want to see, as many of you voted for, the current assessment. Um, because they currently were giving one assessment at the end of the three days. And we did want to see that to see what they had originally thought was really important to use as a jumping off point from which we could expand. Um, and then we wanted to see if there was other data available. Um, we wanted to get a sense of what information outside of this assessment the high school might be able to look at. So for instance, did they track how often a psychologist or a social worker was called into a proceeding? Um, because as I'm sure many of you are, are kind of data nerds like myself, um, and those of you who are, it's always nice to, to get different views on the same topic because sometimes that gives you a fuller uh, picture. Uh, and it's also the case that then you maybe don't have to ask all of the questions of the judges and take up more of their time if you can get some of that information from a different source. Uh, so initially we prioritized this. We did also immediately ask for the slides. So those of you who voted for presenter slides, you were also correct. Um, and much of this general information had already been written down somewhere um, and was information that our Georgian partners had so that we could get it fairly quickly. Uh, next slide. So once we asked for this information, we went through what was provided and came up with more specific detailed questions that again were patiently translated for us. Uh, and we sent those to all of the relevant parties like the psychologists or the other trainers. Um, but by getting the general information from our project team first, we were able to sort of limit these more specific questions to the one, only the ones that we really truly needed uh, to ask. Um, and once we felt like we had the information that we needed, we set about uh, developing the assessment tool and to talk about that process um, and what the tool ended up looking like, I will hand it over to my colleague, Jana. Hi there, and it looks like we have a hand. Um, is it Petra? Yes, that's right. Um, I just, thanks. Uh, I just had a quick question about translation. Um, did you, I'm wondering, did you follow the whole formal three separate translators translation back translation process that my, uh, you know, instructors in graduate school said was the, the right and the only way to do it. Um, and that I have never actually been able to implement it, any of the evaluations that I've done. Um, and assuming that your experience is like mine and you've never been able to do it, quote unquote, right, uh, what steps do you take and what um, steps do you recommend for ensuring conceptual consistency across different languages? Thank you. Yeah, yeah I think Jen is going to talk a little bit about this a little bit later in her presentation, so I won't jump on that part, but I'll give you a partial answer, which is you are correct. We did not have the, <laughs> the three translators back and forth. Um, but we did follow a procedure that sometimes we would get some things that we would look at them and think, are we confused because we don't understand their system well, or is there a translation issue, right? Is it just that like the word that they have chosen maybe means two different things in English? So there were a couple times where we did go back to our partners and say, so on this slide, we think this could mean X or Y. Could you like clarify for us what you could be? So that was sort of the, the procedure that we went through because there were a couple cases like that. Yes, you are, you are absolutely correct that we could not use the, the formal procedures that maybe would have been perfect. Uh, <laughs> if anyone has ever been able to use them, I would be delighted to hear about your experience with that because um, I don't know that I've met anyone. Does that answer your question, Petra? And I'll, I'll kind of expand on more. Okay, wonderful. Um, can we go to the next slide, Abby? 
Great. So once we had all the information we needed, we were able to construct a model of how we thought the program was designed to work, which is what Carly was talking about. Um, in other words, we mapped what happens in the training itself to the fulfillment of program goals. Like, how? what is that line? And then we needed to have another meeting with our Georgian partners. So Abby, next slide, please. And um, Petra, as you said, uh, one of the things is that we had a lot of meetings um, with them. And this, this big one was a consensus building meeting where we went over a lot of different things um, just to clarify. You know, once we had the information we needed, um, we wanted to make sure that we were on the same page about what the assessment was meant to accomplish and what kind of results to expect. Um, and a few important kind of principles of program evaluation, some of which were undoubtedly familiar to our Georgian partners, but they were a group quite like this one, where there were some people who you know, did this for a living, some people who were just really interested in it. Um, so in this meeting, we talked about the difference between evaluating program goals, program outcomes, and participant ex expectations and needs, as well as our ability to do so in this context. We also talked about uh, subjective and objective assessments and some ministerial things like who's going to do the assessment and when should they be given, you know, very much things that we should know. Uh, next slide. So it seems like with um, training program evaluations, everyone wants to know, did it work? Like, that's the question, did it work? But what they often really mean by that is, did people who take the training change their thoughts and behaviors because of the training? And the assumption there is that participants take a training and then internalize the material and change their thinking or behavior in some way that is directly linked to the training. But that is really, really hard to measure, right? Uh, Abby, next slide. So why is this hard to measure? <laughs> because training and learning and behavioral changes don't happen in a vacuum. You know, judges who took the codes of the rights of the child training are individuals who brought different backgrounds, levels of experience, mindsets, learning styles, a whole bunch of different things into this training. And they took all that context out with them when they left. So attributing a change or a lack thereof in participants' behavior directly and strictly to the training itself is very difficult to do outside of the near laboratory conditions or large randomized trials. We weren't able to really do that. So um, in our meeting, we wanted to clarify what kinds of results the high school of justice could expect if they used the assessments that we were developing. Next slide. All right, so the good news is, <laughs> I just told you what we can't do. Uh, the good news is that, is that we can measure, and if we can measure, we can evaluate several other outcomes. For example, we can evaluate program goals as they relate to whether the participants felt like their expectation and training needs were met. In other words, did they feel like this training was useful and pleasant? We can also test the participants' knowledge of the course materials. Next slide. So we've got another Mentimeter poll. Um, so this is a, which of the following program goals are evaluable in this situation? So what do you think that we could actually measure and evaluate? Um, we've got all judges who take this training will adhere to the code of the rights of the child. We've got after this training, judges will feel comfortable applying the code in their courtrooms. Judges who take this training will be better informed about the code. And judges who take this course will be good judges. And you can select all that apply. And Abby, I don't know if you can see the results on there. Let's see what we're looking at here. I love it. Oh, you guys are smart. It, All right, no one thinks that the judges will be good judges or that we can evaluate that. And you're so right. <laughs> All right, I'm seeing less dots, so there's a couple more. All right, I see no dots, let's go to the next slide. 
It looks like most of you think um, B and C. So um, all judges who take this training will adhere to the code of the rights of the child. Oh, sorry, Abby, <laughs> my fault. Um, A, uh, that's gonna be kind of difficult to assess because that's a behavioral outcome. And judicial behavior is kind of difficult to attribute to a specific training program. Um, B was after this training, judges would feel comfortable applying the code. And we say that that is evaluable because it's not a behavioral outcome. It might be subjective measurement, but the judges can tell us directly how comfortable they felt applying the code. You know, Abby, I'm just gonna keep that one up. Um, and C, uh, judges who take this training will be better informed. Again, we can evaluate this goal, and most of you said that we could, yay, um, via something like an objective knowledge test or a subjective questionnaire for the judges. You know, did you, do you think you understood this? Uh, Sorry, Beth, Excuse me, Janet, there's a, a question in the com in the comments. Oh, yes, please. Shanna? A question. Oh, in the comments. Oh. Yeah, it says, how important do you oh, think it is to draw causational impact when identifying outcomes? So we always want to start with a map, right, of what A, B, and C a being the program goals, or A being the training and C being the goals. We always wanna draw that, but then actually working backwards and say that it's causal is really difficult. So we always want to know what the model is. So we always wanna try and draw it, but um, actually evaluating it is often difficult. Does that kind of answer your question? Sorry, Shanna. Hopefully. Oh, hi. No, no, well, I guess oh. I was asking, I mean, I, I agree that that's generally an, an a goal for um, evaluators, but because so many times there are multiple um, things impacting outcomes, uh, you know, often the question becomes how valuable like, was this program in making this outcome happen? And it's really difficult to isolate. So I was just wondering, given the conversation, uh, how much you value it like do you try to uh, do you try to draw those lines so that you can explain them or is it something that is, it's so kind of um ambiguous that it's not worth the effort in most cases um it, it really depends it depends on a million different things. Uh, Carly and I actually worked on a different program evaluation where we were able to do some of that because there was different groups taking the training and we could look at the differences between the groups. But because this one was also so new and it was mandatory, right, um, which you would think, oh great, that we can do a causal because everyone has to take it. Um, it was it it was really difficult to do because of what you said all of the all the background you know if you go back a couple of slides you can see you know the, all that context so here because it wasn't very kind of like strictly tracked and we weren't able to have those lab conditions we just we were looking at different options or di different outcomes um, and we were able to do a few right um, but as far as like direct behavioral change that we just couldn't do it here. Does that make sense? You're, yes, thanks. Okay. Did that answer your question? <laughs> it's always like, it depends. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Okay. Um, is there a level of confidence? Tim, I see your um, question. You're asking about level of confidence. Do you mean, uh, are you talking about a confidence interval? Are you talking about a p-value? Or are you talking about like our personal confidence? Sorry, I didn't mean to get into a statistical uh, jargon. Um, <laughs> just, this is uh, um, the woman that asked, Shanna asked a question, I thought kind of goes to the heart of it as we talk about developing these and and using the information that comes out of the measurement uh, tools, how statistically valid or how practically valid 
is it how much do we rely on it? Um, I'm very familiar, um, interested in the, uh, specifically the juvenile program. We're spinning up a juvenile uh, justice program in Pakistan. And um, as you go through the discussion of the development of the tool here and, and so forth and how it came out, ideas keep popping up in my head. How can I measure this thing that, you know, it'll come out at the back end to, to mean anything? And I just wondered if you had some comments about that. So uh, Shanna's question is kind of central to me. So thank you. Sure. Um, well, let's kind of roll through the rest of this. And we actually have the assessments that we did that we're giving to you. So um, let I'm just going to finish off that poll because I have a great joke. Um, and then, and then we'll get through the actual, like, what did we do? Is that great. right? Perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. So our last thing here was, um, judges who take the course will be good judges. And none of you chose that, which is great because that is not evaluable. And if you have a training course that guarantees good judges, we would love to speak with you because our, um, we also do education here. Okay. So measurement options. Um, so we're talking about objective and subjective assessment here which is also um, a lot of what we've been talking about in, in the chat and in the comments, right? So um, objective assessments measure the facts. That's the stuff that you can put a p-value on. That's a confidence, uh, confidence interval usually, right? Um, they can be direct assessments like knowledge tests or indirect assessments like what uh, Carly was saying before, looking at case data. And I think that sometimes the word subjective has a negative connotation. Um, and, and, and I see a lot of you in the comments, you wanna put this all into something that is objective. And everyone wants to be as analytical and as objective as possible. And as a researcher, I love objective assessments because they're easy to analyze. But sometimes they miss something that is really important, which is how the participants feel and think about the training. And I'm sure everyone here has been through a, the worst types of training. They're boring or nonsensical or not appropriate for the audience or all three or more. And in some ways, it doesn't matter how much you retain from a terrible training if it makes you never want to go to another training again. So a subjective assessment, such as the direct and ubiquitous, how did we do today questionnaire, can help to identify these issues as well as assess some program outcomes that are difficult to measure objectively, such as post-training comfort with the material. I did see a question in the chat about like how much do you, how much weight do you put on participants um, saying I learned something or I felt good there. And I'd say, um, again, it depends, but on this one, a lot. I mean, they know you're asking people, you're asking the subject matter experts, they know how they felt. They know what they, how, what they took away from the training and they think they know what they learned, but we're just gonna have to trust them on that. So, um, Sorry, a subject of assessments can also be indirect, so you don't have to ask directly. You can also ask the trainers to observe the participant behavioral during the course. You can ask supervisors, you can ask court stakeholders. There's other, there's indirect ways to do that. Uh, let's go, I'm actually gonna skip the next poll because I am looking at the time. Um, let's go to uh, the next slide. Uh, Sorry, skipping that poll. Okay. Um, so we also wanted to talk to our partners in Georgia about who they thought could and who should complete the assessments because you can build an amazing measurement tool, but if no one can or will complete it, then it's not gonna be of much use. Um, program participants are an obvious group to assess, but we found out that the trainers would also be open to assessment as well. Next slide. All right. And we also talked about when should we do this assessment? And I saw a question in the chat about this. Um, practically, we wanted to get a handle on when we could conduct the assessment. And some of that required information that only our Georgian partners would know. Like had all of the judges taken the initial course already or were there some that we could assess before they participated and do a pre-post? Um, and could time for the assessment be carved out at the very end of the training day, which would increase the number of participants who could complete it? And would judges in Georgia complete an assessment a few weeks or a year after training, or would they be too busy? Next slide. 
And finally, I wanted to talk to our partners about other programs that they may want to evaluate in future, and if those programs might require different assessment tools. And as a note, in our assessments, and this goes back to another question about translation, um, we want to be really careful to avoid jargon and words that may not translate well. Um, as an example, we usually wouldn't use the word trainer at the FJC, but that's the word that was used most often in the translations that we received. So that's the word that we used in our assessment so that we knew that it could be easily translated back. Let's go to the next slide. We put all this together <laughs> and Kelly and I and me and worked with an, um, did an assessment and we're actually going to um, post the assessments in the chat for you all to look at. Um, next slide. So this is our plan. It's a three part plan. Um, first, uh, we wanted initial assessments that would be provided to participants immediately after the course with follow up assessments six to 12 months after completion and assessments for the trainers. Next slide. Um, so you guys should get in a copy of the initial assessments in the, in the um, chat. You don't have to look at those right now, but they're there. Um, the initial ones are designed to be given to participants at the close of each training day um, because each day had different trainers, right? And they covered different materials. And the initial assessments focus on the participants' level of understanding and belief in their ability to apply the concepts taught in the course, both before and after they take it, as well as their thoughts on the course itself. So how useful and enjoyable they found it to be. So if we couldn't you know, do the, the hard and fast um, statistical measurements, we could ask. So now we've got a poll. Totally just gave away. Next slide, Abby. All right, so what kind of assessment is this? Um, is this an objective assessment? Is it a subjective assessment? Is it both? Do you not know? It's okay not to know. <laughs> I like how bouncy the metameter is. It's like boop, boop, boop. Okay, I'm not seeing a lot of change. We would consider this a subjective assessment as it's not a direct knowledge test. We're asking them, how do you feel that you, or how much do you feel that you learned? Not, you know, is it A, B, C, or D? We're not testing them on that. Um, so uh, the next assessment we gave them was a follow-up assessment, and it focuses on how well-prepared judges found themselves when actually applying the code in the courtrooms, as well as what, with you know, some hindsight, six to 12 months of hindsight, they thought should be added to the training. Um, and to put those responses in context, we also asked if they had a chance to apply several different aspects of the code, and if so, how often? And we thought that this time frame would be especially important because of the newness of the law. It meant that some judges, even very experienced judges, may not have applied it before the training or even a month after the training or a couple months, um, and therefore wouldn't have the ability to actually assess their level of knowledge or preparation right away. Next slide. We have another poll. Okay, what is this assessment attempting to evaluate um, both of them, the initial and the follow-up assessment. Are we looking at the outcome of program goals? Are we looking at behavior changes as a direct result of the training? Are we looking at subjective assessment of what participants learn during the training um, and or the level that participants feel their training needs were met? You can select all that apply. Hopefully that's okay. I was like, hopefully that's more than two people. <laughs> I love that you guys are listening to me. Thank you. <laughs> Jenna, you can only select one. Oh, oh no. Sorry guys. Well, you're still doing good. <laughs> So with these assessments, we were trying to evaluate 
A, the outcome of some program goals, which a lot of you have. Um, the participants' subjective assessment of what they learned, which is C, and the level they felt their training needs were met, which is D. We were not trying to assess their behavioral changes as a direct result of the training, because that would be very difficult for us to do with this particular situation. All right, let's go to the next slide on trainer assessments. So the last set of assessments in that um, document that was um, given in the chat, it are those that are given to the trainer. And they focus on capturing the trainer's unique insight into the way participants interact with the training, um, which you know, one-time participants usually lack. For example, trainers may know that they always need to add more time in a specific part of the program because participants always have more questions about the material in that particular part. And that insight can be used to improve the program in the future. All right, so now I'm going to hand it off to Nino, who is our wonderful Georgian partner, to talk about implementation. Hello, can you hear me right? I'm very pleased to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, which time zone uh, you're in. Um, so I work at the uh, USAID Rule of Law program here in Georgia, uh, implemented by East Coast Management Institute, uh, which was all, already mentioned, in cooperation actually with the ABA Rowley. Uh, but the um, assessment we're talking about that was um, so you know elaborately done by FJC researchers. Uh, uh, was part of a previous project uh, promoting rule of law, aka known as Prologue, um, uh, in uh, 2021. And this was like the final part, like ending of the program, because we were constrained in resources, both material and also the time was, you know, quite limited. That's why um, Carly and Jenna uh, came out with a like an ideal. Um, uh, frame uh, that was possible in this short uh, time span. Um, so as was mentioned, High School of Justice is a major uh, educational institution in Georgia that deals with uh, trainings of in-service judges and it's the the only institution that deals with uh, uh, candidate judges, you know, people who wish to become judges. So the initial training is done through uh, high school. Uh, and uh, we've been partnering with them for almost 10 years now, and we have um, assisted them in developing different types of educational programs for judges as well as judicial personnel. And the two courses that we've chosen was developed by our support. Um, and the high school uh, uh, appreciates and acknowledges the importance of this uh, long-term impact assessment. Um, so they're very keen uh, for us to assist them in this regard and to um, help them develop a tool, an assessment tool that, as was mentioned, will be like a model uh, for them to adapt for other uh, courses. Um, so after uh, FJC researchers um, provided the assessment uh, questionnaires, we have translated it into Georgian um, uh, and uh, and gave it to high school. Um, during that time, uh, already six months and even more had passed after the initial trainings of judges. And uh, as it was mentioned, the code was newly adopted in 2010, uh, 2020, sorry. Um, it doesn't mean that in Georgia we don't have sort of uh, other uh, legal norms that sort of uh, uh, deal with the children in the system, uh, but it was like a framework, um, sort of a code. Um, and all of the judges had to undergo this multidisciplinary training, uh, whoever had to deal with a child as a party or as a you know, witness uh, in a case. Um, so since uh, six months had already passed, uh, we had an uh, idea to test the questionnaire, so to distribute it among judges. Uh, could you move Abby to the next slide, please? Uh, to distribute it among judges, uh, it, uh, more than 200 judges have undergone uh, the training. So the response rate was 25%, uh, which is not high, 
but uh, as you might know with uh, you know evaluating different programs um, uh, with judges uh, because of their busy schedules the response rate is always you know relatively low as compared to other groups so we still consider that you know 25 percent like it, it is a relatively good number and the majority of them had already tried cases involving uh, children um, and they have used and applied uh, this new code um, on child rights. Um, so um, in the next slide, you will see uh, one chart uh, which says that uh, overall majority of the judges were satisfied uh, with the training. Maybe could you please um, turn to the next slide? Yes, so it concerns civil and administrative law cases. So uh, they, the judges felt, and since we were talking that it was more like a subjective assessment, they felt that they were well prepared to apply uh, the code uh, in their practice. In the um, questionnaire, there were questions about uh, suggested topics that they would want to expand on, as well as some suggestions to uh, change the either method or uh, to have more training on a specific topic. And um, as it was mentioned, the trainings um, happened during COVID pandemic uh, in summer 2020. So COVID was new, Zoom and, you know, this online platform, everything was new. So it was like a very intense uh, uh, situation. So it, of course, affected uh, the quality of the trainings as well. Um, and the wish for judges was to have more interactive uh, trainings face to face, obviously. Uh, but overall, they were still satisfied. Um, so based on the results of the, uh, the assessment, uh, high school has some ideas of how to follow up. Um, next slide, Evie, please. Uh, and we as a project are assisting them um, uh, in this regard. So first, um, several appellate court judges um, have done uh, certain research on the practice um, uh, throughout the country, and we're a continental law country, um, and they have found some deficiencies in terms of the um, uniform practice. Uh, and uh, together with high school, we're planning a series of workshops uh, for judges in different regions uh, of Georgia, uh, with judges and uh, with judicial personnel. Uh, the first such workshop will be actually uh, this month, by the end of October, and we plan to sort of do it uh, uh, one uh, workshop per month uh, during 2022 and 2023. Uh, also, high school plans to have uh, like an advanced course because this was more like a foundational course. Uh, and since the code was new, um, practice has already been accumulated and there are certain aspects that seem to be problematic in the practice. Uh, so uh, high school plans to develop uh, an in-depth advanced course on you know, particular topics. Uh, and uh, they will use the assessment tool that was provided by FJC um, from the beginning, <laughs> because in our initial talks, uh, uh, as Carly and Jenna mentioned, it is always better to have the assessment tool embedded before you develop a course. Um, and they plan to do it, you know, properly uh, this time. And we might also assist them um, in this regard. Um, this is all from my side. So if you have any questions in terms of implementation or other issues uh, or like the background information uh, about the country, I'm more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Carly, Jana, and Nino. Um, that was very interesting. And there are a number of questions that people have raised um, in the um, chat, and I hope that they will raise them again now. Um, I just, I'll start off the question and answer with one that I have, um, which is a sort of a collection of um, everything people have said in the chat. And, and that is, um, as you were considering how to measure outcomes, you you decided against testing actual knowledge of participants, either before their training, right after the training, or later on. Um, why did you decide that? And if you had measured that, could you have determined whether some of the subjective measures you got were um, representative of the whole rather than sort of a self-selected group? That's a big question, but... Yeah, uh, sure. I will, I will start and then Jenna and you know can can jump in with what I've missed. Part of it always comes down to 
when you are testing judges, there is a certain level of respect as well. Um, so we didn't want this assessment to feel as though we were interrogating them um, and asking very specific questions about this aspect of the law or that aspect of the law um, could feel a little bit more like we were saying that maybe they hadn't paid attention or that they didn't understand it, which to say to, to a judge, to a practitioner, especially written by, you know, Jen and myself, who are not judges, um, could seem a little bit uh, inappropriate and could be really off-putting and reduce the number of people who would be willing to fill it out, right? Because with the assessments, you know, I, I see in the chat that some people were talking about there's a self-selection bias with who fills out the assessments. And that's definitely true. Uh, and the less palatable you make the assessment, the greater chance that um, they're not going to do it. If they feel as though they're being interrogated uh, and that they could fail the assessment, they may not be willing to do it. Um, and so that's always one consideration that we have. Um, so that was, I think, one consideration. I don't know if Jana and Nino have, have other thoughts on this, but it, it does complicate some of the statistical things that we might otherwise like to do or that some of us have been have been trained to do and are used to doing certainly yeah i will just add one one point that during our discussions with the um, high school the usual practice is that um whenever they do assessments you know this uh, after the training immediate assessment they never ask judges you know like knowledge-based questions it is more like how they felt um about the information that they received uh, how what they think about the trainers the methodology uh the topics that they want to add or expand on so you know this is like a usual practice that you know with judges they do not ask this type of questions so i remember that during the initial talks this was like you know explicitly stated that we don't want assessment to that will sort of attest their knowledge it you know judges will not fill it out and to the second part of your question, Beth, um, yeah, it would have been lovely to have um, to kind of um, support in a different aspect the, the subjective assessments that we were getting back. We thought of a whole lot of different kinds of, of other sources that we may be able to use. But again, we were hampered here because Carly and I are not from uh, the Georgian system. So, you know, things that kind of run through our, our, our minds were, well, we could look at, you know, before and after tests of, you know, whatever judge sees these cases, that's not even, that's not usually something that we can do. <laughs> um, or that's not something that they said that they could do in Georgia to see like how many psychologists were brought in or not, or, um, so we didn't, and it is important to have those other sources and we would have loved to have them, but um, you have to be uh, culturally aware um, and aware, and not only that, but aware of um, what boundaries you have, right? Um, we'd love, we would have loved to, to give them a bar exam, but. <laughs> and, and I see in the chat that we have a question about whether we could have tested specific knowledge using an anonymized sort of group questionnaire. Um, and I think that's, that's possible. Um, as Nino said, though, there's sort of a, um, rule or practice or policy at the high school that that's not something that they do with judges. But what I will say is that the follow-up quest, the follow-up questionnaire, we asked them what topics they might have liked more focus on. And that's kind of an indirect way of them getting to say, you know, now that I've been able to apply this on the ground and I've actually seen some of these cases, I now understand that this is a gap in my knowledge. So that is a way to sort of get at what these more objective questions would have been able to get at, which is where are the gaps in their knowledge? That's sort of a um, less accusatory way, I think, to get at that. It gives them a chance to say, yes, this is an area about which I would like more information without having to say, this is an area that I don't understand. This is a question that I could not answer. So um, someone else raised um, sort of is returning to the question in the chat about assessing outcomes. Uh, many people who work in um, developing programs have to justify their funding by answering the question, is this working? Um, 
And I think um, the last comment sort of um, said that a lot of the the assessment you did was focused on improving the program um, rather than looking at sort of that causal effect that we've all talked about. Um, are, are there ways that you might you know, if you wanted to go the step further, um, are there things you could, you might look back now and say, we could do this now, or if we could, we could add this to the assessment to, to sort of better get that information that the funders would like to see? Um, I definitely think so. One of the big things that um, we could have used there while still kind of staying within our guardrails is before and after, right? So how do you feel before? How do you feel after? Still isn't a direct knowledge test, but it gives us a something that we can run, um, you know, statistical analysis on saying, well, after this training, X number of participants or X percentage of participants felt like they felt more comfortable applying the code or they knew more about the code. Um, it, that does get difficult when you're looking at a follow-up assessment because if you're if um, you don't have enough, you know, enough people taking that follow-up assessment, you're not going to have a good enough group to kind of compare it to. But again, it's all within context, right? Um, and if 25% is a really good return rate, um, then that's a good return rate. And that's something that um, high school can take back and say, well, even though there's only 25% here, they they still said that, that you know, based, you, then you have the three data points that you can show, yes, it does seem like, or yeah. it doesn't, which thankfully was not the case, um, that, that this is working and judges are feeling more comfortable, judges are feeling like they know more about this law. And another thing that we could consider is sort of a pre-post, just even within the training itself, ask them how many of them had consulted with psychologists or so social workers, had used them in their proceedings before, and then add that kind of question to the follow-up. Because it's not a direct sort of, of knowledge test, but it is asking how they've incorporated these roles more into, into the program. Um, and I do see someone talking about like random selection of cases. And it's possible that within their own data that the high school itself could maybe get some of that information and do sort of a more objective pre-post um, without having to sort of ask the judges directly. And that is why we bring up this idea of looking at other data, because sometimes you can get information from that that is either easier or perhaps in some ways um, more palatable to get from the objective data. So one of the questions um, I think that's also at the edges of looking of sort of program evaluation is um, when you're trying to develop a mod returning to your initial um, choice of using this program to evaluate, you said that you wanted to develop sort of a model that could be applied to other programs um, that training programs that the high school was giving. Um, how did this program fit into the overall curriculum, both in terms of its subject and its um, mode of delivery versus um, other programs that the high court offers? High school, so, high school yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so high school has a um, you know, curricula that it uh, um, adopts each year. So it's a separate um, curricula for those wishing to become judges and for judges who are already on the bench, uh, they do um, assessments of what are the main, main, main topics that judges want to get more knowledge about or whether there is uh, some legislative changes or new practice, you know, something that, you know, requires judges to update their knowledge or improve their skills. Um, uh, so since the code was newly adopted and it explicitly said that everyone within the justice system need to have um, interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary training in order to be able to try cases involving children. So this was like a mandatory sort of a rule. That's why this is like a mandatory part of high school curriculum. So every time and all of the judges civil and administrative have um, undergone the training and uh, every time new cohort of judges comes into service they need to take this foundational course 
Uh, and afterwards, uh, we know this talks about developing in-depth advanced courses, also like a requirement of the code, because it states that um, judges and other uh, justice sector institution, uh, like uh, you know, lawyers and others, need to have updated uh, updated knowledge. So this is like a fixed uh, class uh, in the curricula, like a fixed module in the curricula of high school. Um, so it needs uh, adapting, of course. And one part, which is, you know, as it was said, is like three-day course, like legal part, psychology, um, and social workers part. Um, and uh, if you look at the follow-up assessment um, uh, answers uh, of judges, like they like best the, the, the parts which are not legal, uh, you know, involving psychologist and social worker. And these are also the topics that they want to have more training on because this is, you know, uh, the skills that, that they do not possess, like, you know, uh, the questions uh, they need to ask a child or the questions that they should avoid or how they should do it and things like that. So this is uh, um, more like a soft skills for them uh, because, you know, as experienced judges, they know the law um, and then they can apply the new code. Uh, but still, you know, psychologists and social worker parts are um, the ones that they feel that they need uh, more training. Um, and I think the idea of doing pre and post tests, uh, um, also, you know, not testing knowledge, uh, can be an option even during these workshops that we'll be um, conducting, like, you know, to find out again uh, the knowledge gap that they have. So this is like um, the practice um, that we have, because, you know, in, in the context, there are certain restrictions um, uh, that we have uh, in terms of working with judges. So we need to sort of uh, take this into consideration as well. Thank you. Um, there's been sort of a robust discussion over in the chat, and um, I can summarize some of it, um, but I would, um, I'm wondering if, um, others would like to jump in and um, take credit for their good ideas. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm seeing a, a lot of talk about whether maybe doing it anonymously yeah. uh, would help. And I think certainly that is something that in evaluations throughout the FJC, we talk about the benefits to that. Um, because people do tend to be more forthcoming. You're you're absolutely correct. So that is one way to ensure that it does. Sometimes it depends a little bit on on delivery method. So if you they're right in front of you and there's a limited number, that can be um, a little bit more difficult to try to assure. But that's definitely something that um, we frequently employ uh, when we do surveys of judges for exactly the reasons that that all of you are are talking about. Um, one of the ideas I, I liked and I thought was might you you might explore um, that came up in the chat was asking um, for for programs that weren't mandatory for all judges um, to ask judges who didn't take the training how prepared they felt to um, address certain issues versus people who did take the training. It's it's still subjective, but it does give you some good comparison groups. Um, and um, JJ, you have a question that I thought JJ Welling, and I, I'm trying to paraphrase it, but I was wondering if you feel comfortable asking it yourself because I thought it was a it's a good question, and I'm afraid I won't do it justice. Hi there, Beth. Thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And I really want to appreciate um, the presentation today and talking about sort of all the nuances. Um, assessing, uh, evaluating judicial training, which is um, sort of fraught with difficulties, which we sort of have touched on. Um, but I'm wondering about sort of the approach of sort of co-creating an evaluation strategy with our host nation partners from the outset, um, and whether that helps uh, potentially, you know, get at some more of that objective data um, that you have said would be helpful for a more maybe robust or maybe comprehensive evaluation. And I'm just wondering sort of with your uh, experience and expertise 
in this area, what are you, what do you see as kind of the benefits and the trade offs of that approach? Um, yeah. I can think of a few, but I'm curious what you would say. Yeah, um, I mean, and I'm going to try and answer this quickly because mindful of time, and I know we have another presentation, so we should probably. We have about, we have until 1020, 1021. Okay. okay. Um, so I think that's a really good question. And especially in this project, we could not have done this without help straight from the beginning, um, specifically because of the language barrier. But I think in any program evaluation, you know, Jan and I have done program evaluations of programs at the FJC. So like even within our own organization, working with the people who actually implement the program, who have all of this information is vital because if you don't understand the program well, then you can't evaluate it. And they are also the ones who can tell you if there is some kind of information that will give you the objective data, you know, that you're talking about here. Um, and so you can work with them from beginning to say, what other kinds of data might you have that we could also sort of incorporate to supplement? So I think you're right that sort of talking about that from the beginning. We did talk about that, I think, and, and Nino and Jana might uh, remember these conversations more clearly than I do, um, but we did talk about that at the beginning and due to the compressed schedule, uh, we weren't really able to get that teased out from their court data in the timeline we had. Um, but I do think that you're right, that starting right on the ground with the people who know it as well as possible to see all of the data that may be available is really helpful to try to get maybe both the objective and this objective parts together. Okay, there's um, a group from um, Columbia who have a question um, about your surveys. Um, and basically it's, it's a question about survey administration and how you guarantee a representative sample in, our fo in your follow-up surveys and what strategies do you use to basically increase the response rate? Okay, I, I, I will I will jump at that one. Uh, uh, what we frequently do when we administer surveys is we find that sending a few reminders helps, especially if you're surveying really busy people, because sometimes the people who speak first, and there were comments in the chat about uh, response bias, the people who respond most quickly might be those who have the most to say, either positive or negative. So you're going to get responses skewed to one of those polls. Um, and the people who maybe feel like they don't have that much to add might not jump in right away. Um, so we have found that sending out reminders, as simple as that is, really does help because it's just a way of saying, for those of you who haven't responded, we are still really interested in your information. Um, and that we have found does a pretty good job of like of, of bumping that up. Um, so that's one way. I don't know if, if Jana and, and Nino have other thoughts. Uh, I definitely think that uh, the, the survey design is a big one. Um, you know, I'm sure that um, you received a survey and you've looked at it and it's super long and kind of confusing. There's a whole bunch of um, open-ended text boxes. Um, you're probably not going to complete that survey. Um, so the short and to the point, um, our, our director Beth says, quick and clean. A quick and clean survey is going to give you the best chance of of increasing that rate. Um, also, if you, and again, it, it's, it very much depends on the context, right? So if you are in a judicial system and you're, you're working with people who, you know, maybe you have a, have, you know, the chief judge, you can call the chief judge and say, you know, I really uh, would appreciate if you encouraged other people to do it. Of course, you've got to be really careful about that because then you could, you have to call all of the chief judges. But, but um, you know, getting other people's buy-in and also shaming works. Um, it's been proven that if you say, you know, 50% of your call of, of the people that we sent this out or 70% of the people we sent this out to have responded, but you haven't, they're going to think, oh, I'm behind. Um, that's not for use all the time, but it is something that, that, that has been proven to work. They, they proved that with voting. So there's a whole bunch of different strategies that you could use. And I would say it really depends on how important the survey is. Um, so if it if it's something you know that you're using to improve your program, well, that's important, but it's not life saving, right? You always have to kind of 
uh, balance it out because um, something at, at the FJC, we really, um, really pay attention to how much of an ask we're, we're, we're making towards these participants and how often, you know, because if we're working with the same group again and again and again, we don't want to ask too much of them all the time because when that really important survey does come, we want them to trust us enough to say, this one is very important. We, you know, we, we really, really want you to do this one. And to know that, it, that we don't say that for every survey. So I think that that also, um, that also helps. But survey design, the easiest one, um, in my opinion, quick and clean. I think that brings us to time. Um, does if unless someone has a very pressing question, um, I think um, I will thank um, Nino, um, Carly, and Jana for their wonderful presentation. And um, I encourage everyone um, to read the chat um, for a, sort of more input and ideas. Um, there are a couple of ideas I thought particularly. Um, useful for trying to get at the outcome question. Um, if you have more time than um, the high school had for this particular project. Um, and when you're working sort of with um, in a more, um, as you move forward for the high school, um, they may incorporate some of the ideas as well. Thank you. We're going now to introduce uh, our Danielle, who's our senior uh, gender equity and social inclusion uh, advisor here at ABA Raleigh. Uh, Danielle is going to introduce us uh, to a broader view of gender equity and uh, social inclusion, and also how to address a uh, measurement in this regard. Danielle. Thank you, Silvana. Hi, everybody. I appreciate uh, those that are still here in the room. I know that we did have some people drop out, probably due to time. Um, so thank you for, for staying and for participating. And um, I think some of the things I say, I might, might let, let's see how they're taken by this audience. I, I know I saw somebody in the room from UNODC, which I was very happy about because uh, some of the points I'm making I've taken directly from um, some UNODC resources. And I want to share m who I am and where I'm coming from because that will frame this discussion. I am not an evaluator. I am not a Merrill or Mel professional. I'm a uh, political scientist. I have a PhD in political science with a focus on gender justice and politics and comparative and international politics. So um, I will not be getting into the weeds in terms of, of measurement in the way that the previous discussion did, but I know that I have some very capable male colleagues um, on this call. So if there's anything that gets too out of my scope of comfort, I'm sure that my colleague Jeanette would uh, be able to jump in. So I'm going to ask that we don't take any questions during my talk because I want to get through it as quickly as possible and then open it up for questions at the end. So what, Abby, um, we can go to the next slide, please. All right. So what I'm talking about is gender equity and social inclusion. And, and Sometimes certain donors or certain partners like to separate out um, looking at gender and including gender and other inclusion um, categories of, of people and individuals. And I believe that it's more fruitful to, to take a, a wider approach where you look at it together. So where you look at gender issues and then issues of inclusion and marginalization of other people as well. So that's the framework I'm taking here. I'm not saying it is the best framework. I'm not saying it is the only framework. I am just saying that, that I have found that valuable in my work. So we need to define and operationalize what we mean. And what we're going to look at mainly is inclusion, first of all. So when I say inclusion and when I talk about inclusion, I am including gender into this. So basically, in a nutshell, um, gender equity and social inclusion is about understanding and responding to the needs of everybody, not only the most visible. Um, 
So inclusion seeks to actively center or account for those who have been traditionally excluded or pushed to the margins of society. Uh, these are people who have less power. And what's important is that the, the, the reason that they have less power isn't because of who they are as a person. It's not because of some something at the individual level. It's, it's because of systems of oppression, and these are intersecting systems of oppression uh, that, that happen at, at, at multiple levels of analysis, right? And these are systems such as patriarchy, ageism, xenophobia, homophobia, classism, caste, ableism, racism, etc. And these systems exist and operate both formally and informally. So there could be something codified like in a law, or it could just be something sort of ambient um, in, in the atmosphere, um, something in, in culture or society, perhaps a norm. And um, people are marginalized based on these systems due to things such as their race, their ethnicity, ethnicity sorry, their um, in in being an indigenous person or not, um, people having varied soji, which is sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. People are excluded based on age, based on nationality, migration status, including statelessness, um, ability or disability, socioeconomic status, class, caste, religion. It's a whole basket um, full of ways that people are marginalized because of these systems of oppression. And so an inclusive approach acknowledges that because of the experience of marginalization um, due to these systems, that people have different needs, or, or in, in our case, to bring it to the justice sector, different experiences interacting with or being affected by the justice system, whether that's as seekers or as users or as practitioners, uh, such as judges. So we need to understand and address, or at least seek to address, if we're being honest, um, this, this experiences of marginalization if we want to have sustainable solutions, which is a, a big goal of what we're all trying to do here. If we don't address marginalization, our work is really only going to help those people who are most visible, those people who are not marginalized. So it's, it's, it's an action that you have to take. If you only go by the default of just who's in the room naturally, you're gonna miss a lot of people. Um, so inclusion is a conceptual and operational framework that seeks to increase the full and active participation of marginalized populations, um, seeks to respond to the diverse needs of all citizens, accommodate different styles and needs for meaningful participation. This is a big thing as well. We see people now sometimes getting towards um, having captions in meetings or, or having sign language. And so this is a, a big move towards inclusion. And it also examines and accounts for, and in some cases seeks to address, but not always, these systemic inequalities and these formal and informal barriers that really undergird and influence marginalization. So it seeks to move beyond just the individual and to acknowledge that there are these big systems and that if we really want to, to change people's experiences, let's say change people's experiences with interacting with the justice system, it's not just going to be an issue of changing the way that that system operates, right? You have to look at people's experiences with that system, how able they are to access it, what they experience when they do access it, this sort of thing. It's also a technical and methodological approach that centers knowledge, experience, and evidence across all aspects of program design. So um, in the design, in the implementation, during monitoring, during evaluation, like, like we just heard from, and research and learning. So the full program cycle. Um, also, hopefully, it will create more responsive, representative, accountable, and participatory activities programs. And if we're really shooting for the stars, uh, more inclusive structures and societies, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a framework that, that doesn't just seek to change the programming that we engage in, 
in some cases, not all, it will seek to actually address these structures of oppression so that people are able to, to not just more effectively participate in our programming, but they're more effectively able to participate in their societies or in the justice systems that exist in their societies. Um, it doesn't just come out of nowhere. It builds on an architecture of international and US government policies and strategies that promote justice and protect rights including the new draft USAID rule of law policy that's focused on people-centered justice and uh, puts people and their justice needs at the center of the justice system, um, also contributing to a growing body of international human rights standards, <laughs> approaches, and commitments that seek to go beyond simply the institutions that we work with and that we engage in. Um, to look at people's lived experiences of justice. Uh, people's lived experiences vary based on their experiences of inclusion and exclusion in their societies. So if we want to successfully engage in things like people-centered justice, we have to use this gender equity and social inclusion approach because this helps us understand people's lived experiences so we can account for the difference in the ways that they intersect with and engage with the justice system. All right, next slide, Abby. So this is just a bunch of theory, right? People might be saying, well, so what? What does this mean? What does it mean in practice? There's multiple ways that we can engage in, in, in Jesse work. There's standalone programming and there's integrated programming. So standalone programming is kind of what's most understood. It's where a program is specifically designed on a, a gender equity or social inclusion thematic area, promoting individuals with disabilities in the legal profession, countering trafficking uh, against girls, access to justice for LGBTQI plus people, securing indigenous people's land rights. The, the entire focus of the program is about something related to marginalization. But there's a, a second way of doing integrated programming, which is what we really hope to move towards. And that's where gender equity and social inclusion considerations are incorporated across the entire program, no matter if it's supposed to focus on a marginalized group or not. And so this means that uh, Jesse is everybody's business. It's not only the business of the gender advisor or the inclusion advisor, it's, it's everybody should be focusing at, at all points in the program cycle of, is this program inclusive? Is this program actually centering the needs and lived experiences of, of people who perhaps have not been centered in the past, uh, but need to be? It's, it's not easy to do because it does require this continued um, engagement. It, it looks at how we craft activities and it, and it looks at how we do it in a way that outcomes and outputs actually serve the people that we're trying to reach and work with, not just serve the, the wants or needs of, of us who are designing or engaging in the programming. Um, I'm really distilling this down and there's many things that, that I'm leaving out here, but it asks key questions about and measures. This is important. Who's included and who is excluded um, and who we work with? How do we eliminate or mitigate barriers to this exclusion and increase their participation, their access and their representation? What should we do concretely in our activities to try to make sure that, that there is increased access and inclusivity and what specific deliverables would increase access and participation? And how do we measure that? What are, what are the best approaches to measure access and participation? Because it's, it's difficult, <laughs> as, as we heard from the, from the previous presentation, right? It's, this is something that's very difficult to measure. So what would we do and how would we do it? It requires sustained and meaningful engagement, like I was saying. It has to be integrated through all aspects of the programming cycle. It's not just, just a one-off action. 
A lot of programs now require a gender equity and social inclusion analysis, which is fantastic. Uh, but often that happens at the proposal stage uh, the, because the proposals are supposed to be so short, you get one or two pages. Uh, and then quite frankly, it's put on a shelf, right? And then all of the findings from that analysis aren't actually woven in to the programming. So you do have to have your analysis, but, but that's the start. That's not the end. You also uh, can't just have, um, you know, one training on what is Jesse. So let's tick the box. Let let's have a training for everybody on what gender equity and social inclusion is, and leave it at that. Also, you can't just have one indicator that is disaggregated by by sex. I mean, that's a start. Absolutely, we need that, but that's not going to get us. To, to where we need to be. When, when this happens, you don't actually get integration. What you get is, is a mirroring of the marginalization that exists in society in the first place because it's, it's marginalized in our programming. So we really have to be thoughtful about how we do it and we have to do it at, at, at multiple points along the cycle. We also have to include safeguarding and, and do no harm considerations. And I saw one of the participants was asking about ethical considerations um, you know, in evaluation. And this is really important to do. And, and the reason that we have to do this is because these Jesse approaches consciously try to examine and address power differentials and big structural issues of oppression trying to change power differentials is is fraught right because it means that some people might feel like they're losing power and so what happens is if you don't really consciously try to ensure that your programming safeguards people it doesn't cause harm you will get harm cause it might be unintentional but um it does happen and i'll give an example from when i was working in iraq um and this was not a program that i was working on it was just something that that was happening um when i was there uh for example you could have um you know very well-meaning programming that that seeks to increase women's participation in the police force as as, as traffic officers right well, traffic officers is a very front facing, it's a very public um, position. And you have these deeply entrenched social norms, or at least at the time, that, that women really weren't welcome in the public sphere, uh, uh, other than as you know, mothers or, or going shopping in the store. So having these female police officers was something that was really like in the face of everybody. And, and some of these women um, were getting harassed, they were getting beaten by their families, they were getting harassed by people on the street because um, th they just weren't ready to see them. So it was a very sort of well-meaning idea to do, but because the programming wasn't designed with safeguarding ideas behind it, some of the participants actually ended up maybe not having such great outcomes. So this also happens if like you try to create a, let's say, a, you know, police desks that, that focus on gender-based violence, but you don't account for the fact that that people in, in that particular community don't actually want to go to the police. They consider it a private matter. They consider it a family matter. And so when they do go to the police, they will get shunned by their by their community for doing that. So we have to make sure that programming is thoughtful about what some of the unintended outcomes could be. And there was also something else that came out of, I believe, the presentation uh, before me which was uh, do nothing without them. So always center the needs of, of the people that we're trying to work with. Consult with them first, ask them what outcomes they would like to see and, and, and how, they, how they would define perhaps some of these things that we're trying to look at or change. So always, always, always consult with who we're trying to work with. And I can talk more about this in, in the Q&A if anybody's interested. Um, next slide. I, I will, yes, next slide, that's great. So here's what we're all here for. Measurement, what, what, what does this have to do with measurement? Obviously, effective integration requires effective measurement. And building a body of evidence obviously demonstrates the achievements that taking a, a just the inclusive approach can, can bring. It can increase political will to focus on um, and increase investment in this goal. 
So programs should incorporate Jesse into the theory of change, into the result or logic framework, into the indicators, into the um, evaluation approaches. And programming should also consider, if possible, again, this depends on the donor, um, adapting performance measurement frameworks and other assessment tools to account for longer timelines and the complex nature of change. Because to, to really get Jesse outcomes, because we're trying to shift norms and, and change societal structures, that's not going to happen in a one year, uh, you know, $1 million program. You might get the start of that, you might get the seeds of it, but you're not going to have those really robust outcome level or in, impact level um, results. So um, also, we need to be honest about unanticipated results. Okay, thank you, Silvana. And um, this means encouraging people to report on things that happen positively, things that happen negatively, and again, ethical considerations need to be at the forefront. So here's where I think it might get a little controversial, um, but it is helpful to use both quantitative and qualitative approaches if we're trying to, to, to measure um, JESSE outcomes because they do complement and, and cross-validate each other. Qualitative approaches and methods provide the richness and depth that we need to identify people's lived experiences with the justice system um, and, and be able to design interventions that, that address their impediments to accessing justice because it is about people's lived experiences. And so in order to, to really truly get our hands around people's lived experiences, a, a quantitative approach or method might not be the, the, the best way to go about really trying to deeply understand why somebody has experienced marginalization and how they've experienced um, that marginalization. So um, when we're seeking to address structural systems of oppression as well and the related processes like norms or discourse, qualitative approaches can help because they can capture those contextual shifts. That, that can be challenging to measure. And the approaches can include things like process tracing, outcome harvesting, most significant change, um, using a grounded accountability model, and then using qualitative data collection methods like key informant interviews, focus groups, or um, open-ended surveys. And so um, JESSE indicators really need to be developed at the design phase of the program. and Obviously, they should be disaggregated by sex and other markers of marginalization, but that's not going to be the whole story, right? That will show us who's in the room, but they won't show us how they've experienced that room or how difficult it was for them to access the room. Um, quantitative indicators are, are preferred, and I get that because qualitative changes are, are not as easy to measure, but when possible, do try to include qualitative approaches and measurement tools if if we want to look at at just the outcomes and i realize i'm i'm almost out of time here so there's other tools that i will i will put in the um in the discussion boards and we can look at but what are some other ways that that we can measure jesse obviously the the jesse analysis that i spoke about which happens at the beginning and then from the results of the analysis there's hundreds of different frameworks on, on a JESSE analysis, but usually they cover things like, um, you know, social cultural norms and practices, laws, policies, and procedures, patterns of power and decision making. And then those results should feed into a JESSE action plan, which is your roadmap, right? So you have your analysis, you have your work plan of what you're trying to do, and then you actually do an action plan, which I'll, I'll give you an example of. And, and this is where you really operationalize. Okay, all of these findings, how are we gonna work this into our programming? What types of indicators are we gonna use to capture this? What methodological approaches are we going to use to capture this? And um, how are we gonna make sure to stay accountable throughout the entire programming cycle that we are focusing on Jesse? Otherwise, it might just fall to the wayside. All right. Thank you. I am done. And I would love uh, 
I have a question. If um, one one of the, I really appreciated um, your um, discussion about um, objective and subjective an evaluation. Um, one of the things um, I've done with an organization um, that I've worked with outside of the judiciary is we do surveys and we we ask them sort of their perception and their ideas for enhancing um, diversity and inclusion within the organization. And we ask questions about their own experience. Um, and as expected, we got a range of responses and it really across the board, but you know, one of the things um, the committee that sort of um, wanted to do the survey, you know, one of the things I said is we've been talking about this for 20 years. Um, is there something I can do to show you what effect all of that talking has had, or are we just talking more? And are we just surveying yet another time? Um, and so what we did is we actually looked within the organization, we looked at positions. Um, by um, different categories. We were very fortunate, it's a small organization and we had a lot of um, demographic information about people. Um, and so we looked at um, sort of leadership positions, both sort of the high leadership positions as well as committees, committee chairs, committees, um, all sorts of um, positions, whether they'd been asked to give presentations and looked at trends over, it was, I think I, a 15 year period. and. I felt we were able to conclude that we, some of the talking had made a difference, um, but I really felt that we really would have made much progress if we didn't have that objective data to look at, um, because it, it also identified some holes um, that were so easily remedied. Um, like for example, who, who was requested to give presentations, for, for example. Um, and how diverse that was. So I just wanted to put a plug in for both um, subjective and quantitative, I mean, subjective and objective data. Thank you. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, so, okay, Petra, let me uh, qualitative. Uh, oh, <laughs> well, okay. So I am, uh, from my lived experience, uh, as a political scientist um, and as, as a researcher, not as an evaluator, there is always this sort of bias that quantitative approaches are more rigorous than qualitative approaches. And so qualitative approaches are soft, they're normative, they're not going to get you scientific data that you need, and, and they're somehow biased in some way. It's this sort of you know, specter of, of positivism that is still very much hanging over um, at least academia and also probably in, 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 you know, monitoring and evaluation as well. And so you do get these sort of people who, who really are entrenched in this idea that quantitative approaches are, are the only approaches that, that will actually get you, you know, this like the, the participants performing objective um, data and that somehow objective data is of more value than subjective data. Uh, that, that is why. Uh, and then Martin, I, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. I, I see that you, uh, that you, uh, sorry, agreed about the mixed method approach. Yes, I mean, I'm hoping that 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 we are we will as as we as as a group turn um, shift a little bit to, towards the understanding that qualitative approaches are not by nature less rigorous, you know, that they are absolutely as rigorous if implemented correctly, and they can be turned into quantitative, um, you know, measurement indices as well. Like you can use a key informant interview to gather data about people's lived experiences and, and then turn that into something that, that you can actually quantify. It just, it just depends on what method is the right method to use for what you're trying to gather. And when we're trying to look at, at gender equity and social inclusion, because we're really trying to look at the why and the how, um, it, is, it is really important that we make space for and understand uh, people's lived experiences. I'm just going in into the chat now. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, add sex, gender, call day day. What additional key variables would you recommend evaluators already add? Well, like I said, I'm not an evaluator, so I can't. Uh, I I can't say. Well, this is. But but for me, what I would be interested in seeing is what was your experience with X, whatever it is that 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 we're trying to evaluate. What was a person's different lived experience with it? And then also did the programming take that into account in the design phase? So at the sort of in the design phase, was the program designed to take into account difference and, and di people's different experiences and different needs of accessing the program? And then did the program itself actually respond to those? And then at the end, was there a better result for these people because the program was designed to include them? And then uh, Petra, yes, 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 Petra. <laughs> I agree. Uh, feminism and racial justice movements have been critiquing objectivity as a concept for over 60 years, uh, hoping that some of the critique will have uh, set in. J, are assessments on bias, useful and needs in justice sector programming, ethics, if there are examples? J, I do not know the answer to that. Anybody in the room, if anybody has an answer to Jay's question, are assessments on bias useful and used in justice sector programming that aim to address ethics and capacity improvement of judges? If there are examples, how do judges respond? Were they willing? Great question. If there's anybody that, that can answer that, let's hear it. If not, perhaps we can do some research and uh, Jay, you and I can, can do some digging. No one, I saw somebody did unmute. <clears throat> okay, if nobody else is asking a question, I'm gonna pick your brain a little bit. Um, one of the um, difficulties we have when we are assessing um, diversity is what measures to use. Um, as you know, we have, you know, like for example, the US Census Bureau has particular questions. Um, which have been critiqued over the years and some, and in some respects modified over the years. Um, but we haven't found quite the right questions to get at diversity um, in terms of um, just um, sexual orientation, um, gender identity, um, ethnicity, um, that's a little easier, but um, is there any place that has collected different measures that explains the pros and cons of asking questions in a different way? Um, some of our questionnaires go to a very conservative population, and sometimes we're concerned about um, reactants, um, that they won't answer the, the questions um, if we answer and ask them in a particular way. Um, suggestions for that? I saw Carly nodding her head. Carly, if you have a, a, an answer for that or right now. I think, no, I think she was nodding her head because she's working on something. Oh. Her, <laughs> yeah, we, we've had extensive discussions about how best to to like label these categories. Like, are we the best people to be labeling these categories? Is there somewhere that we could look? Um, so, yes, no, my, my nodding was simply in support that I am delighted that Beth is asking you this question. I see that that Martin has put something in the in the chat and the answer is there's all sorts of places that that oh and Jay's raising her hand so I'll, I'll finish up quickly and then let Jay speak. There's all sorts of places that that do have this this data. I know that we were asked a question just on in terms of um, <clears throat> SOGI issues, you know in terms of how people identify what what do we want to put in and then that opened a whole pandora's box of the pros and cons of having people self-identify is that something that maybe they don't want to mm -hmm. right and so then when you're looking at the ethical considerations are we are we asking people to identify as something and they don't feel comfortable if you're like i gave my iraq example um 
a religious or ethnic minority, maybe you don't want to self-identify as that, uh, you know, religious or ethnic minority. So there's also that question of weighing the need to get the data and disaggregate the data because it, it helps and people feeling uncomfortable um, with identifying. Jay, yes. Uh, sorry, we have only five minutes left. So if we could be very brief, we mm -hmm. would appreciate it. Yeah, Beth asks the best questions always. Um, I'm very appreciative of that question for because that is a common concern in Mel in justice sector programming. And we are always left with asking ourselves, what is the minimum level of variables we could ask so we don't have to press on, you know, choose your battles, especially when we're faced with more, you know, um, an audience that is more selective in what they um, they answer. I think I was going to point you to <laughs> UNODC's um, statistical database. For sure, it provides us like a map of what variables we could ask that is related to um, diversity as well as gender. Um, but I would also I would also highlight that you know if we look at political science um, and academic material um, from other sectors, we could learn a lot. Um, but the application, I guess for the justice sector is always going to be contextually <laughs> complicated. Um, so I don't really have a direct answer, but just maybe we could post some sources that we've uh, we've been using in Roly that could be helpful. Maybe you have some also FJC has done a lot of this work as well. Well, today we, we have actually focused on actually people's rights because we chose these two segments so as to deal with one of the most i would say challenging things that we 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 need to measure we need to focus and we need to assure and we need to be able to measure uh, we thank you we thank especially the the fjc uh, that you know you have shared with us i mean that tool that you developed uh, with the High School of Justice in Georgia and have shown us and shared with us uh, the challenges and the tool that you developed and, and, and how to implement it. Uh, and this tool that, as you will say, could be applied and used as a model to measure other kinds of pro programs. Danielle has shared with us a much broader uh, focus spectrum of what we understand by Jesse. So we thank you very much, Tanielle, for having done this with us and also to have started to discuss. I mean, we wish we had had more time, but this is just the beginning of the discussions. Uh, and we would also like to thank the participants because many of the questions, the questions that were raised and points that were shared were very interesting, particularly some dealing with, you know, how to approach the judges measuring things because they're judges and we need, here we have a particular challenge, which is how to be coherent when measuring with all the constitutional and judicial ethics requirements that judges have and that we need to be coherent. So here we need to be very cautious when dealing with the measurement, as we know of, uh, for instance, judicial training or any other programs that deal with uh, the judiciary. So thank you all very much. And we would very much ask you to please fill out the survey uh, in this last uh, Mentimeter questions that we're going to, to, to offer to you. And thank you very much, everybody, for joining.